Good morning. Today is June 17th, 2024. And our form that we're going to talk about today is the 22 EF, the evidence of funds. We will be talking about what the purpose of this form is, um, in what ways we can disclose funds in our transactions, why it's important to disclose your funds, um, and are you required to disclose contingent funds or non-contingent funds? Uh, what happens if the buyer wants or doesn't want to show the seller they have the proof of funds? And how can the seller give notice of termination if they should choose and should they? So first and foremost, why do we have this form? Well, as per the purchase and sale agreement, so I'm just going to be referencing form 21 when I talk about the purchase and sale agreement, paragraph A, um, it states right here that the buyer is the buyer states that they are relying on no other source of contingent funds other than what's disclosed in the purchase and sale agreement. Um, this means that anything not disclosed, the buyer is representing that they have cash in hand ready to pay for this purchase. So what does contingent mean? Because it says that they're not relying on any other source of contingent funds. And how do we ensure those funds for our client are non-contingent? Well, the purpose of the 22 EF is to document the disclosure, basically of where 100% of the funds needed to purchase are coming from. And 100% means the full purchase price and any closing costs that are going to apply. So asking our clients when we're writing up an offer where the money is coming from should not feel like it's any sort of violation. It's no fair housing violation for sure. Um, we must accurately represent where the source of the funds are coming from. Um, and if they have questions or issues with it, we need to refer them back to the purchase and sale agreement in paragraph A um, if there's any pushback for providing. All the personal information when you do provide proof of funds should be redacted for the protection of your buyer. So let's look at the 22 EF. I pulled up the form in its entirety right here. Um, this form is a disclosure of incoming money that's being used for the purchase. This is not a contingency. As you can see, this form is not a contingency, but an addendum because on the top it says, um, I'm sorry, I can't see my own handwriting. I, it says the evidence of funds addendum. So when using this form, um, but we want to make sure that we're disclosing the remaining funds that have not already been disclosed. Anything you put here should not be anywhere else in the purchase and sale agreement because we don't want to disclose twice. There are clearly defined definitions for what the evidence of funds means. So the evidence of funds are documents from a financial institution in the United States that show the buyer has the sufficient cash or cash equivalent um, from United States funds. So if, um, if they have a bank statement that shows they have sufficient cash in there, as well as the cash to close uh, that a lender may be charging them, um, then you can go ahead and use that as this proof. Now, you are not actually required to disclose non-contingent funds because if you refer back to paragraph A in Form 21, it basically says, your funds are non-contingent unless otherwise noted in here. So non-contingent funds, the definition is that the buyer already has in their possession. They are not waiting for anything else to come through to make those funds available. Um, now, non-contingent would be um, no other item needs to be sold. So you're not going to have those non-contingent funds from a home sale contingency or a pending sale. Um, and then contingent funds themselves are when something else needs to happen, an action needs to happen in order for those funds to be available. It could be um, waiting for gift funds, selling personal property, um, selling a home. So um, just kind of keep those two definitions side by side. So now how do we disclose this? Um, remember, we're re required to disclose where all of the money to fund the sale um, are coming from. Purchase and sale agreement says, unless otherwise noted, all funds are non-contingent and readily available. They are cash. So there are several ways in our contract that we can disclose where funds are coming from. We can use a 22A. 
If our client has a loan they're applying for, we are going to use a 22A. There may be a down payment involved in that. Um, if their pending sale is, you know, I'm in contract, we're going to use a 22Q. If they need to sell a home, we're going to use 22B. And bank statements I put up there just because if neither of those forms on the bottom are being used and they are cash, um, that is a way that we can disclose where that money is coming from. Now, if we have a cash buyer, we can use bank statements. Um, we can use letters. There's all sorts of ways we can disclose where that's coming from. Um, but if we have home sale contingencies, we want to make sure that we're not dual disclosing where those funds are. Definition of non-contingent, again, in a financial institution in the United States, readily available to withdraw immediately and in the buyer's name. So did you know that this form, 20, the 22EF, not only discloses where the funds are coming from for the purchase, but it also makes a promise from that buyer to use those funds specifically for the home sale itself. Um, by signing this form, the buyer is also signing that these funds are available and they will not be used for any other purpose other than the purchase of this home. So think about how this translates to a 22A, um, like for the buyer's down payment. If we have, <clears throat> excuse me, if we have a buyer who's putting say 10% down, and I wanna use an example of maybe an $800,000 home. The buyer's putting 10% down on an $800,000 home. Um, that would be an $80,000 down payment. Well, then the buyer, the buyer has to come up with this $80,000. So number one, you should be thinking, do you have this $80,000? Where is this $80,000 coming from? Um, but then that happens and the buyer decides, well, gosh, now I need to furnish this home I'm going to be buying. Um, or maybe uh, I wanted to buy something, you know, my, my, my teenage child, a car, but I can use cash. I won't be financing. So the lender won't have any red flags pop up. Well, these funds having been put in the 22 EF are already promised that home sale purchase. The buyer has not, um, so the buyer, if they were to spend these, would technically be breaching paragraph two right here because they'd be using those, per, those funds for something that's outside the home sale purchase. So think of maybe recourse that the seller may have on this or maybe some confidence that it might give the seller knowing that the buyer is signing off the promise to not use these funds for something other than the home sale itself. So once we have the disclosure of whether those funds are contingent or non-contingent, we're going to have to actually prove this to the other party. So if you look at these examples right over here, we're going to need to provide some sort of a statement or a document from the bank um, that shows that the seller or shows the seller that we have these proof of funds. So how do we do that in a legitimate way that provides everything that seller needs? Well, the bank, the statement on, well, it's not really a statement. The picture on the left is a bank letter and the picture on the right is a screenshot, okay? The picture on the left is an acceptable document from the bank that shows there is proof of funds. It connects the buyer with the lending institution and shows that there is enough money to purchase. So I'm using a $600,000 example right now. The screenshot to the right does not say who it is, where the banking institution is, um, or really any other item except line items with dollar amounts in specific accounts. We want to make sure that we are giving our sellers the most confidence they can get with the buyer's ability to pay um, with a legitimate form of the proof of funds. So do you see anything else wrong with maybe the screenshot to the right? Well, there is a mix of sources of those funds. Some of the funds listed on the screenshot are non-contingent and others are contingent. So make sure if we're trying to prove non-contingent or contingent, depending on where you are in your contract, um, we wanna make sure we're not using an example on the right, and we are using the example on the left. So why not um, make 
why 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 would we make this mistake over here? Um, what could really happen by us sending something on the right and calling it the proof of funds? Well, the seller does have the right to ask where all the money is coming from for the property. And if the seller does not get shown proof of funds, whether it be liquid cash right away or the contingent funds being converted to readily available funds, that seller does have the right to terminate the contract and move on to another buyer who might make them a little bit more confident with their ability to close. Buyer agents, you should be letting your buyers know that this could happen if those funds are not disclosed properly. And seller agents, you need to be making your sellers aware of their right to ask for the proof of funds. So let's say these two pictures are two clients trying to get a $600,000 home. What if um, the buyer doesn't want to disclose all of their funds because they're trying to negotiate and they don't want to put all their cards out on the table? Um, if you have a buyer that has a bank statement with an excess amount of money in it and they don't want to show it right away, even though those funds are not contingent, they are readily available funds and you don't technically have to disclose non-contingent if they're ready to go, um, you should consider using the 22 EF, giving yourself those three days worth of time or however much you put it in there and asking the bank or whatever financial institution to provide a letter that shows that the cash is available for the amount that you want rather than putting all your cards on the table, say on the right side, where there's a $2 million balance here mm -hmm. um, to negotiate on a $600,000 home. Um, you can use just like a lender letter, um, the amount needed for the purchase. Okay, so defining again, contingent funds means funds that a buyer does not currently have, but expects to receive from another source prior to closing different types of contingent funds that we are used to are home sales um, lo loans. What we want to make sure of is that we are not redisclosing a loan that we have already disclosed in the 22A. If there is no financing contingency, then the loan box is a correct place to disclose a loan if a loan is being used. So this would be the case where a Loan is being used, but the contingency protection that the financing contingency offers is not going to be held. So all you're saying is we are going to be using a loan. However, I am waiving my right to retain my earnest money if my loan should fail. If there's no 22A, then the loan box is correct. The, the 22 EF also offers verbiage that allows a lender to conduct all of their inspections, their appraisals needed, anything else they need to do in order to close this loan. Um, without this paragraph right here, uh, paragraph um, line 35, 36, and 37, um, the lender really has no right to access the property. So if you're not disclosing that there's a loan on a 22A and you're not disclosing the loan on a 22EF, then what you're saying is I'm paying cash and there's no reason for anybody to enter this property in order to do an appraisal. This is also the paragraph that you would use to disclose another um, a sale of another item. So if you are using a 22Q or a 22B, there's no reason to redisclose that home sale in the line in line uh, 24. This space would be used for um, a contingent sale that has no protections of 22 of those 22 Q and B. So if you wanted to sell a home without the home sale contingency protection, you could put that here. It would also be a good place to put any sale of personal property, um, any sale of something uh, that you are relying on to purchase this, this home. Um, if you're selling a boat or a car, anything else like that could go in line 24. Now, if a buyer is relying on financing and uses a 22A, but also needs to sell their boat in order to make that down payment, 
then the down payment funds would be contingent and that would be a place that you would put them in, um, line 24. Anytime there are contingent funds being used for the down payment, you need to make sure that they're being written in here. Because why? Well, because Form 21 says, unless otherwise stated, it's cash. So clearly that is not cash. You need to state, you need to state it in here. Now, if the buyer fails to sell um, what they need to sell in order to get that cash and they have a 22A in place, um, they may not be protected under their financing contingency because their down payment was not cash. It was a source of contingent funds. So we want to make sure that if we have contingent funds and a financing contingency, that we are disclosing all of those things in the same purchase and sale agreement. We want, we'd want to cover that entire discrepancy. Gift funds from a family member. Um, not on the title would be considered a gift. So this is a gift that is not meant to be paid back. Um, gifts are pretty self-explanatory. Now, line 26, funds that are not readily available to the U.S. banking institution. So this would be things like stocks, 401ks, any non-U.S. bank account that needs to have any conversion into what the definition of non-contingent funds are. If the buyer is relying on government assistance for their down payment, um, but does not want to make that approval for government assistance a contingency in their contract, you could write that down here on the EF as far as the government or the down payment program. Um, that's going to be a discussion that you may want to have with your buyer because there is actually a place on the 22A to write the down payment assistance program as well. Um, so make sure that you have that discussion before you start putting things down there. They can use that under line 27 if they choose. Now, if there is anything that doesn't fit into these categories, you can place it in the other. Um, I have seen things in this line like hard money lenders or, um, you know, some other source. Maybe there's a settlement, a lawsuit settlement that they're waiting for that could be in the other. Um, it's a pretty open space for you to, if you just don't know what to do, put it in the other. Remember, paragraph three with contingent funds, because there is an action that needs to take place before closing to convert them to non-contingent funds, um, that timeline is counted backwards. This is a prior to closing timeline. And sometimes you're going to need that timeline to do that conversion. Stocks and 401k sometimes can take one to two weeks to convert. Um, so get that timeline in place. And um, if your sellers are, or sorry, if your buyers are relying on a source of funds that need to be turned into cash, make sure you're giving them enough time to do that. Now, if the buyer cannot provide proof of those funds needed to close, there is a clause in here that allows the seller to terminate and move towards another qualified buyer. All right, let's think about the definitions that we just talked about with what is contingent or non-contingent. So when you're discussing your offer and you're writing it up, after your buyer tells you, here's what I want to offer, here's my down payment, or here's how I'm paying, your first question should be, where is the source of your funds for either the down payment or the entire purchase? Ask them how they're paying and where the money is currently. Uh, because this absolutely does matter with how you disclose this. So a refresher, contingent funds are funds that need an action to be converted into readily available money. And non-contingent are checking account, savings account, liquid cash, ready to be paid immediately. So think ahead with whether these items are either contingent or non-contingent. So cash under the mattress. Gift funds, 401k, savings account, selling a boat, selling a home, getting a loan, and a down payment gift. Cash under the mattress. Um, technically, it is contingent because it is not in a U.S. bank institution in the buyer's name. Gift funds are also contingent. 
because there's an action that needs to take place in order to prove that those funds are in an account in the buyer's name. As is 401k cash also has to be converted. A savings account is non-contingent. Those funds are there, readily available in a banking institution and can be spent immediately. Selling a boat is contingent. Now, when you talk about selling a home, 22B, um, these funds are contingent. However, we are not going to be disclosing them on the 22EF because if there's a 22B in the contract, they have already been accounted for. Getting a loan, the same thing applies. If your buyer is getting a loan, we are not going to also disclose it on the 22EF. And if there's a down payment gift, it is also contingent. Any monies that need to have an action again to be spent are contingent. So that includes a gift that you have not yet received. So why don't you want to disclose a loan on the 22EF and the 22A? Well, there is going to be a contradiction in your protections for those funds. The 22A is a financing contingency and the 22EF is a disclosure of funds. So in the event of a financing fail, how will the buyer be protected if both forms are in place? Um, will there be a clear path to who retains the earnest money? And the answer is no. One form says I'm waiving my right to do that. The other form says I am retaining the right to keep my money. So make sure you are not dual disclosing the same monies. Now the 22EF will not hurt a seller in any way, nor will it protect a buyer because this form is a communication form to accurately disclose where all the money is coming from in the sale. If the buyer has no contingency protections and fails to close, they will lose their earnest money to the seller. So what if proof of funds is not delivered? If there is no proof of funds at the time of the offer, so a lot of times as practice, we will send over um, a copy of a bank statement when we put our offers in um, just to kind of give uh, that seller a nice warm fuzzy feeling that our client is very well qualified and can, and can make the purchase. But what happens if there's no proof of funds at the time of your offer and you want to ensure the buyer provides this? Well, you can add a 22EF into the sale, triggering the buyer's to deliver that proof on a specific date. And it may be that the buyer doesn't have access right away, or they may be apprehensive about giving out that information. So I wanted to pull up a couple scenarios on proof of funds, mainly talking about how you disclose these and is it contingent or non-contingent. So if you're disclosing a loan on a 22EF, how can we ensure that we offer proof of funds with the boilerplate timeline? And can we provide proof of funds 10 days prior to closing? So we do not have a financing addendum and we are noting on the 22EF under contingent funds that we have a loan we're getting. Now the default to this is 10 days prior to close. So if we think about what happens when we have a loan, do we have readily available funds 10 days before closing when we're financing? And we don't. We can't provide proof of funds um, 10 days prior to closing. If we are disclosing a loan, such as what a conventional or a FHA, sometimes even a HELOC, depending on how quickly that process moves, um, keep in mind the funding for these loans may not be available until the day of closing. So if you're using the 22EF to disclose a loan, you're going to have to write probably zero days before closing that those funds will be available. Sometimes it would be one day before closing, but the lender is not going to release those funds until everything is in place and we can remember when we have our clear to close. That's our timeline we wanna work backwards from. So what happens if the buyer is financing and they want to put 20% down? Their down payment will be paid from their stock account. How would you write this up to represent where 100% of the funds are coming from? Well, you would use a financing addendum uh, to mark 20% down. 
Then you could additionally use the 22 EF to show that there is a contingent source for their down payment. And you would write that it's coming from stocks. So the 22A would disclose 80% of the purchase price for the loan and the 22 EF would show the other 20%. So in the entire contract, you're accounting for 100% of the purchase and sale. Now, without the disclosure of the contingent funds, you are um, risking the protection of your buyer's financing contingency. Remember that all funds have to be accounted for. And if they're not listed as contingent, then you're representing that they're not. Here are some odd situations that you might want to think about too. All funds relied for the sale must be disclosed if they are contingent. If contingent funds are relied upon towards the sale and the contingent funds fall through unless they were disclosed, the buyer may not be able to recover their earnest money with their financing addendum. Buyers need to accurately and honestly represent all funds required to purchase and 100% of the price should be disclosed. So here's another question to think about. A buyer has liquid funds in a US banking institution but they are in the name of his father's estate. The buyer is named as the executor of the estate. Are these funds considered contingent or non-contingent? So think back again to the definition of non-contingent funds in a US banking institution, readily available in the buyer's name. Those funds are technically contingent the buyer is only a beneficiary, but does not have access to the funds as only being named executor of the estate. If a 22F is being used to disclose a loan and the appraiser calls out work orders, what happens next? And is there any work order contingency? Um, does that seller have any obligation to cooperate? I'm bringing this up because sometimes work orders do get called out and sometimes low appraisals get called out. And if we remember the 22 EF is not a contingency with protections, but it's just a disclosure. So in line 36, it says the seller must allow the lender to conduct any inspections they need, but the seller is not required to pay for those inspections. There is nothing here about an appraisal. So no, they don't have, um, they have no work order contingency. The buyer has no protections on this call out by the lender. So if the seller can choose not to cooperate, the seller doesn't have to cooperate and could potentially wait out the buyer being unable to perform to collect the earnest money. If you want your buyer to have protections with an appraisal, um, I would consider doing a 22AA, which is the appraisal addendum, if you are disclosing your loan on the EF, but still want that appraisal protection as this form itself will not give that to you. How would you prove the availability of gift funds? Any gift funds have to be in the buyer's name by the specified time in the 22 EF um, for proof of availability, or they can be deposited directly into escrow from the gift giver. Now, if the buyer fails to provide the proof of funds, the seller does have the right if they choose to terminate the contract and move towards a more qualified buyer. So exercising this right does, however, leave the buyer the right to retain their earnest money due to the termination being the seller's choice. So um, in, the sale must fall or it must fail to close on the closing date due to the funds not being available to the buyer or sorry, not being available in order for the seller to receive the earnest money from the buyer. So as far as strategy goes, you're going to want to maybe keep your sellers and buyers aware of these consequences, but sellers can't collect anything unless the buyer has actually failed to perform. And if the seller does initiate that termination, then the buyer would receive their own earnest money back. So be aware on how you advise your clients if this is a situation you find yourself in. So there's a lot of strategies we can use when it comes to the 22 EF. Um, these, this form can actually help make our offers more competitive um, because thinking about things like what are some of the consequences of using a loan 
And if we use a loan and, you know, we have a well-qualified buyer, um, are we needing to keep the protection of the approval for that loan? Or is it the appraisal for that loan that we're trying to keep by using the financing contingency? If we add a 22AA, which is the appraisal addendum, then we could disclose the loan on the 22EF um, and keep that appraisal. Do you, um, did you know that your buyer also may not be locked into their interest rate when their pre-approval is written? So if the buyer is getting this approval, are they pre-underwritten? Have they locked it in? If so, um, you know, find out more questions when these forms come through to you. Uh, we have all these ways that we can make our offers um, remove a little bit more of those protections, um, you know, if we're on the selling side. And on a side note, um, because this just came up in I, my squirrel thinking here, um, as a side note, if a buyer has been approved for a loan and has not locked to their rate, um, those rates can actually change and your buyer may no longer be qualified to purchase the home. Uh, when they have a financing addendum, they have that protection of that approval. When they have a 22 EF, they do not. So think of other ways we can use the 22 EF to maybe strengthen some of our offers. If you are a buyer and this is an option, you know, you also need to know some of those potential weaknesses so we can support our buyers and make sure that we're representing our buyers in the best way possible. Um, we want to make sure that we are keeping the contingencies that our clients need and in the same ways we are able to maybe waive some others to make our offers stand out over everybody else's. As a summary, I'm going to pull up the form one more time. So just remember, we have this evidence of funds. All non-contingent funds are already pre-disclosed that unless it's stated otherwise, our entire purchase and sale agreement is going to be on funds that are readily available. You're required to disclose anything that's not readily available. Um, if you want to strengthen offers, pre-approval letters, and um, sometimes the bank statements with those available funds are going to help. A seller can and should ask where the money is coming from. Any of the closing costs or um, anything prepaid, uh, appraisal fees, lender fees, should also be accounted for in the evidence of funds. Those can end up being quite costly. Um, and I did actually do a breakdown because if you have a home that is, you know, three to 5% down, you're going to be looking at potentially, you know, 24,000 to, you know, $50,000 in closing costs. And that along with the down payment that can get upwards of 50 to 80,000. So as a seller, I would want to know that, first of all, a buyer has that kind of money to come to the table, and second, where it's coming from. I appreciate you listening, and I would love to talk about maybe some of your scenarios with your evidence of funds. If you have any questions, please reach out to me.